So we're going to talk about async JavaScript. And so basically what we're going to do is take an overview of just some of the patterns that we've been using in JavaScript up to this point, and some of the pros and cons of those, and then kind of catapult off of that into the new async functions that are coming in a future version of JavaScript. So we're going to take a deep dive into those as well and figure out how they work and some of the pros and cons that are with them as well. So my name is Jeremy Fairbank. I have a blog at blog.jeremyfairbank.com. I'm El Papa Pollo on Twitter if you're interested in following me. And I'm also Jay Fairbank on GitHub. Just briefly about me, I work for a company called Push Agency. And we are a completely remote team focused on design and mostly front end work. In addition to being an agency, we also have our own product called Simply Built, which is a website builder and editor along with domain management and hosting. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we have some free t-shirts and stickers at the end if you're interested. So we're talking about JavaScript today. And JavaScript has grown tremendously over the past several years. What once was just a tool for form validation, interactivity in the browser, has now grown into the server and robots and the internet of things. So JavaScript has proven itself to be a very versatile, powerful language for almost anything. Yet one thing hasn't changed about JavaScript, something that I would say is both a blessing and a curse of JavaScript. And that is the thread, the single lone thread that all of our applications run on, especially in the browser. And I say that's a blessing because, because of this limitation of the single thread, we have been able to develop amazing, cool patterns in JavaScript. But at the same time, it is a curse, as with any single-threaded language, that we deal with this issue of waiting or blocking. So with JavaScript, that's even more pronounced, because if we do any type of I.O. that could potentially block, or if we do some CPU-intensive work, that's not only going to block the progress of our program, but it's going to potentially block the browser tab and make a really frustrating experience for our users. So how have we dealt with this particular issue? Well, we have the concept of asynchronicity, that we will handle this code in an asynchronous manner. So if I want to do some I.O., like an HTTP request, then I can put that off on the event loop, let that work in the background, and then I can keep going with my code. And then at some point later in the future, I can be notified once this asynchronous action has com been completed. And so this is a really powerful concept that we have gotten thanks to the limitation of this single thread. So what are some of these asynchronous patterns that we use in JavaScript? Obviously, the most well-known is the idea of the callback. So I like to think of this as a token, almost, that I have some sort of API, and I know it's asynchronous. It's going to perform some action in the background, and eventually it'll complete. But I need to keep moving forward and making other useful work happen in my code. So I'm going to provide this API with this token, the callback. And once it's complete, it will essentially cash in that token and allow me to respond to that particular action once it's completed. So concretely, we have code like this, where I can fetch a user by their ID and then provide it with this callback token that once it's actually fetched, I either have an error or the user, and I can act appropriately. So this is a very useful pattern in JavaScript. And I'm not here today to knock on callbacks. They are still very useful in particular places. But obviously, we know some issues can arise if we only use callbacks. We can run into this sort of incurring token debt, where once one piece is asynchronous, other pieces that depend on that can end up being asynchronous. So if we follow this token pattern, then we can have this token build up and where we have nested callbacks. And so if we were to flesh that out to some complex function like this, where we fetch a customer name for an order, we can see how this happens. I fetch the order, I get back the order, then I'm ready to fetch the customer from that, and then I have another callback to where eventually I have the customer name and I can invoke this original done callback that was passed in. And so this presents some issue. This debt that we incur with these tokens is we we gain this debt of 
not having as much readability, not as much maintainability with this type of code. So aptly, we've called this the callback hell, where we've deeply nested all these callbacks, and it's made it harder to maintain this code and read sort of its flow and know what exactly is happening. Another potential issue, which this is more subjective and based on your own opinion or preference, but when we need to deal with errors with callbacks, we might see a pattern like this, where we have the error first, payload second type callbacks. We're now to handle errors, we need to check does the error exist and then take appropriate action. So we can't utilize things like try catch blocks per se if we want to use those. So is there a different pattern we can try to apply then since there are some issues with callbacks? But what if instead we flip the relationship and instead of giving a token to our API, the API gives us a token with the guarantee that once this API is done, we can consume that token multiple times and react to the fulfilled value of this particular API. And this we know and love or maybe hate as the promise. So the promise token, as I said, flips that relationship. So now the fetch order inside here is going to return a promise. And then I can chain together these then callbacks that handle the resolution of the order. And then I can fetch a customer and then I can handle that resolution and get back the customer name. So some of the benefits we gained from this is now it became more readable. We've flattened out this callback structure. And so we can read this and see kind of where the flow of our program goes a little easier. So promises are really powerful pattern too and very useful, but they can be problematic as well. And again, I'm not here to knock on callbacks, not knock on promises. They are very useful, but we can sometimes even run into this particular issue. And it may be based on how we've developed our API and our code base, but we can build up then callbacks as well. And so one of the biggest issues is once one piece is async and anything that depends on that is going to be forced to be async as well, then we can still deal with a potential mess that could be unreadable and unmaintainable. One of the other biggest issues is this idea of swallowing errors. So one problem with promises is that when we have particular errors that are thrown or rejected in our asynchronous code, if we don't explicitly handle those, then it could silently fail. It won't be reported as an uncaught error. And I think Chrome is an exception to that, that it will at least notify you of uncaught exceptions. But this can be problematic if we're not diligent in always explicitly handling errors. It would be nice if the browser could help us out a little and let us know if there was something we did not explicitly catch. So obviously with the promise code, then we have to explicitly define the catch callback where we can catch any particular errors that might be thrown or rejected and then handle them appropriately. And so the nice thing about this at least though is with this patterning of handling errors is that it sort of mimics try catch blocks because we have this catch function now that can handle it, but it's still not necessarily native. We can't use a try catch, catch block with this. So we've been getting there, so to speak. And I'm not the foremost authority on async in JavaScript by any means, but I've seen how these patterns, they've, they've had pros, they've had cons, and the patterns have worked, but we've slowly been get, trying to get to something that is at least more readable, more maintainable, and easier for us to reason about. So we kind of have this wish list almost where it would be nice if we had readable code, and that it would look and feel synchronous so that we can read through it and know what's going on, how it's flowing. At the same time, it has to be non-blocking. If it's gonna read like synchronous code, we don't want it to be actual synchronous code or that will still create a frustrating experience. And then finally, it would be nice if we could utilize some of the native flow con control constructs like a try catch block, or as we'll see, maybe if statements and for loops. So thankfully, that is possible now thanks to the async functions. So async functions, they are a future feature for JavaScript. They're currently in stage three for the proposal stages for ECMAScript, which is the JavaScript standard. Originally, they were slated to be included in ES7, but they were unfortunately delayed. So right now, they're still far along the proposal stage, though, that they will more than likely end up in the JavaScript standard. So what are async functions, actually? Well, notice we've added a few new words here. We have the async word, 
which we're gonna just prepend to a function declaration. And as that suggests, it declares this function as an async function. You could also use this with function expressions or the ES6 method definitions. And then inside this function, we can use these await operators. And these only work in async functions. If you try to use it in a regular function, it will be a syntax error. But as await suggests, it's going to await some operation. Wait for that to finish, and then retrieve whatever the fulfilled value is, and then we can assign it to a variable like normal synchronous code. And then we can even return something from this asynchronous function. This was our original example where we get the customer name. And we'll dive more into that in a little bit. And then finally, as I mentioned, we can use native language flow control constructs. So we can use this try catch block now. So I can do these asynchronous await operations inside a try block and any potential errors that might happen, whether it's asynchronously or a potential synchronous error like a reference error, I can catch all those and deal with them with my catch block. So with that high level overview, let's now start diving in more and learn more about these async functions. I want to start off with just a word of warning. As I mentioned, this is a stage three proposal. It's not quite yet standard JavaScript. And it's probably very unlikely that it won't be dropped. But there is still the possibility of that. So be forewarned that if you choose to use this in production code, be ready to handle any of the consequences if this does get dropped. That recently happened with the object observe proposal a few months ago. So there's just the little warning before we dive in. So let's start off with that await operation and let's kind of get a feel for what it's doing and what it's accomplishing. So we're gonna start off with a simpler example, a couple functions where I'm gonna fetch an order based on the order ID and then a function for printing out the order. So the fetch order, it's gonna use the new fetch API that's being proposed for browsers, which is essentially like helpful sugar over XHR requests. So it returns a promise, which has a HTTP response and then from that, I consume the body as a JSON data stream. But the real part I want to look at is this print order function. So it's going to utilize that fetch order call, which returns a promise. And remember, with promises, we attach our then callbacks, which allow us to consume the eventual value that's going to be retrieved from this asynchronous function. So we, we get that. We understand that concept of how we use then to retrieve these values. Well, that's what we're going to use with async await as well. So I'm gonna rewrite this as an async function. And instead of attaching a then callback to fetch order, I'm just gonna await the fetch order call. And that's gonna essentially do the same thing where it's going to wait for it to fulfill, pull that fulfilled value out, treat it like an expression that I can then assign to this order variable. And then I can proceed with logging out the order. So let's kind of look at this and sort of pictorially just to get a better feel for what all this means. So let's treat the fetch order that returns a promise as something like this. It returns a box that contains order. So promise, you know, that wraps a eventual value. So we're gonna use box as our analogy. And so what happens when, when we want to await this box? First thing is we're gonna treat it like it's an open box. The value hasn't been fulfilled yet, so we're gonna wait for that to happen. So it's gonna sit there, wait, in a non-blocking fashion, remember. Eventually, the value is fulfilled and it's in the box. And then this is sort of what await's gonna do. It's gonna then essentially take some scissors, cut open the box, pull open the flaps, and then sort of like a plunger, just pull the order out, and now we've retrieved it. And so, Nothing too complex there, but just to give you sort of a picture view of what's happening with this wait, of how it's able to wait on that eventual value and then pull it out and use it like an expression. So we've got that down, but what happens next? We want to log out this order. Remember, this is all happening asynchronously. If this was normal uh, asynchronous code where we just call fetch order, we didn't await it, we know we can't immediately log out the order because it's not gonna be available yet. That's at some undetermined time in the future. So let's, let's walk through a potential invocation of this and let's look at this from the view of a, maybe a JavaScript engine or a transpiler. And so we're gonna basically transpile this to something that we understand with promises. Now this isn't exactly what you might get with Babel. It uses a regenerator runtime, but we're just gonna keep this at more of a high level with promises. 
So we're going to invoke it with an order ID of one. We go inside our body. We know we encounter this await on fetch order. So that's going to tip us off to do something here. What we're actually going to do is we're going to take that awaited expression and wrap it in a call to promise.resolve. So we're going to translate this to something like this, where we create a promise with this promise.resolve call, patch in fetch order, which we know returns a promise as well. Now we're doing this because we're going to want to make this API consistent. So technically, we could await non-promise values. But we know that essentially it's going to transpile to a promise.resolve call. So when I call promise.resolve, it generates a new promise. If I pass in a normal value, then that promise immediately resolves to it. If I press, pass in another promise, then it's going to resolve to whatever that inner promise resolves to. So it sort of flattens out the structure of the value from the promise. So this is a little different than what I showed you with the picture, with the box. So essentially, it's like as if we had boxed this two times. So we got our promise. We now need to deal with the second part where we're going to log out this order. We can't do this like this right now because we know this wouldn't work. In fact, this would be a reference error, but it's not available yet. So what we need to do is treat the rest of our code as if it was wrapped in a then callback from that promise. So we'll translate it to that. We have our promise. We'll attach the then callback. We know that will unwrap the eventual value of the order. And then we can log it out. And then finally, we're going to do this curious promise.resolve we're going to return, and it's taking in the value of undefined. And we're going to see why this happens here in a minute. But this is sort of a high-level picture of how these asynchronous functions work, how they might transpile to sort of promise uh, equivalent code. So we're going to apply that then to one of our earlier examples, which was that customer name where we fetch them for an order. So we waited the fetch order. That means we'll resolve it. We'll get the order, we'll await, which means we'll resolve the fetch customer, which finally gives us the customer. And again, notice we're returning promise.resolve at the end. But this time, we had explicitly returned the customer name. So we're going to wrap that with promise.resolve. So let's take a moment here to think about then what are asynchronous functions actually returning. So if I had a simpler example here. This function, meaning of life, it's an async function, and it just returns 42. Does that mean when I invoke this function, I'm going to get back 42? Well, as we saw with the previous examples, we're led to believe that actually, no, that is not the case here. What's really going to happen if we apply that same pseudo transpilation logic, we're going to turn that into a call to promise.resolve with 42, which therefore means async functions return promises. And this makes sense. We are going to potentially have asynchronous code inside these functions. There's no way to say that if I return 42 from here that I, should, I know that I can just return 42 literally from the function. I need to have a consistent API. So whatever I explicitly return, it's actually going to be a resolved promise with that value. And so that's what happens then when we return values from promises. And the earlier example where it was undefined, that remember, that's the implicit return value from JavaScript functions. So now let's switch gears. We've sort of seen how async functions work, how we can return promises from them. And let's look at error handling a little bit more again. So we already saw this earlier. We could wrap these with try catch blocks. And we apply that here. We can put the fetch order that we're awaiting inside the try block and get the order and log it, and we can handle any potential errors. But my question is, what are the errors that we can potentially handle here? What kind of errors? So let's rework that fetch order function. Remember, it uses the fetch API. And, and now we're going to just do a check on the response status code. So if it was a 404, then I can throw an error in here. Well, that try catch block can catch that error, even though it's happening inside this then callback, which is asynchronous. We don't know when that's going to happen, but we can catch it. So we can catch these errors that are thrown. And if we wrote this function instead with maybe a promise, resolve, and reject, we could, in this example, return the promise and use jQuery's get API as an example. And if that fails, check the status code again and reject the error. And that, too, can be caught. So as we see, any type of error that can happen in these promises, which 
normally we would have to use a catch callback, we can use try catch to catch those with our async functions. But let's stop and think about this. So these errors are happening in promises. What did we learn earlier about promises and errors? We still have a potential for errors being swallowed in async functions. So unfortunately, this isn't something that was necessarily solved with async functions. And typically, I would prefer if we did have some sort of fail-safe default where if I don't explicitly handle an error, I wasn't diligent, that at least the browser will let me know that, hey, there was an error you need to look at. You didn't catch this. So that's one downside and just one gotcha I just want to make you aware of, that you still have to be explicit about catching any potential errors in your async functions. So now let's take it a step further. We saw we could use try catch blocks. Does that mean we can also use other native language control flow constructs? Yes, we can. So here we can use it with an if else statement, for example. So I have a find or create order function, takes the order ID, and then I can check if the order exists, but I can do it asynchronously. So I can await a call to some order exists function that eventually will fulfill to a bo uh, Boolean value. If that's successful, then inside my if, I can await the fetch order. Else, I can await a create order. So we can see, pretty intuitive, we can utilize this with if else statements. What about for loops? So in this example, I'm using the for of loops that are new in ES 2015. And notice here, inside my loop, I can await this fetch order call. And so we're looping over all the order IDs, we're gonna fetch them all, and then we're gonna print each order. And so what that basically means is that when I fetch an order, I can suspend execution of this loop until I fetch the order, and then I can log it. So yes, we can utilize this with for loops now too. But this does raise an interesting question. Could this be a problem? There is a potential performance issue with this approach. So let's say we want to invoke this function with the order IDs one, two, and three. Let's kind of unravel that for loop and see what we're actually invoking and see where the problem exists. So when I invoke this, remember I'm awaiting each turn of the loop. So when I await that first order that I'm fetching, I'm forcing this serialization where the second order, I can't even issue a request for the second order until the first order has been requested. Once that's complete, then I can fetch for the second order. But that's still, the third order has been waiting now on the first order and the second order to be fulfilled. And then finally, I can fetch that order. But we see what the problem is here. We force this serialization. As far as we know, there's no dependency amongst these orders and how we fetch them. So it'd be nice if instead of doing this sequentially, we could do this in a parallel fashion. So we can rewrite this actually and still use async await. So now what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna utilize promise.all. And if you're familiar with this or not, what promise.all does is it takes an array of promises and it will fulfill or resolve itself when each of those individual promises resolved. And if any of them reject, it will reject. But we can use this with async await to take the order IDs, we're gonna map over them with the fetch order function. That'll give us an array of promises. And then we can just await this top level promise.all call and get back all the orders at once. And then we can loop over every order and print them out. So again, if we sort of unwrap this implicit loop here, what we're basically doing is, it's as if we'd called promise.all and passed in this array where we fetch all the orders at the same time. So we can exploit this pseudo parallelism and then await only one promise. And so to highlight why this is important to think about, and it was one of the early gotchas that I ran into when I was playing around with that, let's just look at this simple demo here. So basically what I have here is we're gonna run that function call where we print out the orders for order IDs one, two, and three. We're first gonna run it sequentially and I'm gonna just display some metrics from that. So you can see now we start, we're starting to get some results in. We have two metrics here. We have a wait time and a response time. So wait time, as that might suggest, it's 
how long we have to wait for this particular order before we actually make the HTTP request. So for the first one, it was basically zero. It's one millisecond, but basically zero seconds. And it took a second to respond. But notice what happened with the second order. Its wait time was also a second. And that's because it had to wait on the first order to respond. And then that one takes a very horrible six seconds to respond. But notice how that impacts the third order. Wait time was seven seconds. So we had the sum of the response time from the previous two orders, one and six. Which means we had to wait seven seconds before we could issue that request. And then it takes two seconds to respond. So finally, what we end up with is that the total time to issue all these requests, get through that loop, took us nine seconds. And that was the sum of the response time for every order, one, six, and two. So now let's see what happens when we run these in parallel. So notice immediately, it looks like it was snap here. And we can see for the wait time for every order, it was basically zero seconds. That's because we issued all the requests at the same time instead of making them wait on one another. And then the response times were all about the same. But notice now the total time when we ran these in parallel. It only took six seconds and not nine seconds. So if you've ever done some distributed computing and dealt with barrier algorithms, this is similar to that, where now we're issuing all these at once, and we don't proceed until they've all completed. And so we're only limited by the slowest response time, not by the response time of each order. And so that's why the total time is only six seconds, not nine. You see, that's because this second order had the slowest response time. And so that was just a helpful, simple demo that I just um, hope would show you to be careful with this sort of gotcha. Even though we can use this with for loops, maybe that's not always the best use case for it. We need to think about the dependencies that our asynchronous actions might have amongst each other. And if there's no need for that dependency, then maybe we can do things all at once and then await a promise.all call, for example. So as we begin to wrap up, I just want to leave you with some resources if you would like to get started trying asynchronous functions. You can use them now thanks to Babel, which is a transpiler for ES 2015 and future JavaScript code. So there are quite a few dependencies you will need to install, but you need Node and NPM, and then you can install um, Babel Core, in this case, we'll use the command line, Babel CLI, and then the preset for ES 2015, and then some plugins, uh, one for parsing async functions, and then others for transforming it to that regenerator. And these slides will be available online afterwards, so you can reference this. I know that's a lot to go on the command line. And then once you have that installed, you can have your Babel resource file, where you just define your presets and the plugins you need for asynchronous functions. And basically what that allow you to do then is then invoke the Babel node um, binary on your asynchronous file and get your asynchronous functions to work. And then finally, just some links that you might find useful and interesting. First one there is a link to the spec document for async functions if you want to read through the actual spec. And then there's a link to the repo for the async functions so you can just track the progress of where it's at, how it's doing. And then finally, just a more general link for ECMAScript if you want to follow all the proposals that are currently in flight for ECMAScript. And with that, thank you all so much for joining me this morning. <laughs>